It is the best-selling book in history. No volume ever written has been more loved and quoted. And its words, sometimes simple and sometimes mysterious, should always be studied carefully. It is the Bible, the Word of God. Welcome to Bible Answers Live, providing accurate and practical answers to all your Bible questions. Our phone lines are open. If you have a Bible-related question, give us a call now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, here's your host from Amazing Facts International, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Hello, friends. Would you like to hear an amazing fact? Only one in 10,000 diamonds found are colored, and only one in every 100 diamonds is greater than 10 carats in size. Furthermore, only one out of 200 diamonds is flawless. So you can imagine the worldwide astonishment when miners in Angola, Africa, discovered a 170 carat flawless pink diamond in July 2022. Named the Lulo Rose after the mine where it was discovered, the 34 gram rock is believed to be the largest pink diamond discovered in the last 300 years. The former record holder is a 182 carat Daira Yi Noor found in India in the 17th century and it now resides in the National Bank of Tehran. It's hard to say what this diamond will sell for after it's cut, but just for comparison, the pink star diamond shattered every price record when Southbee sold it in April 2017 for a staggering $71.2 million at a Hong Kong auction. It was the single most expensive diamond or jewel sold at an auction. And catch this, it took professionals more than a year and a half just to cut and polish this pink star. Now, the pink star was 59.60 carats. It's anyone's guess what the 170 carat Lulo Rose will sell for. You know, Pastor Ross, it's amazing how much a rock will sell for. <laughs> I know. I mean, to get something that rare, that strong, so beautiful, oh. apparently flawless, I mean, that's an incredible find. One wonders how many diamonds of that quality is still out there buried under the ground that nobody knows about. Mm. But, you know, talking about valuable rocks, probably the most valuable rock is not diamond or some type of emerald. It's written on stone, and it's put in a golden box, and it's hidden away for many, many, many years. Of course, what we're talking about is the Ten Commandments, the most precious rocks, not because of the rock per se, but because of what's written on the rock. That's right. You know, I kind of like rocks. Yeah, I lived in a cave, and we were surrounded by rocks, and you actually get to know some of them and their shapes and their, their design and colors. And Christ is often compared to a rock in the Bible. He said his word. He said, he that hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man building on the rock. And you can read in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. And Peter says, we are lively stones built on that cornerstone of Jesus, who is mm -hmm. the rock of ages. And that's, you know, rocks in the Bible represent something enduring and perfect. If you're going to uh, want something to last, like the pyramids, or even a tombstone, you, you make it out of stone. It, so it'll last. And that's why God wrote his law on rock, because of its enduring nature. He wrote it with his own hand because his law doesn't change. That's right. I mean, people's opinions come and go, but the word of God endures forever. You might want to know more about this very special law written on stone there in that golden box. You don't have to go find the golden box to read what's written on the stone. It's in the Bible. It's mm -hmm. the Ten Commandments. We have a book. It's actually one of our study guides called Written in Stone, and it's all about the Ten Commandments and the principles that we find in Scripture in that law. If you'd like to receive this free gift, all you need to do is call the number 800-835-6747 and you want to ask for offer number 111 or ask by name, written in stone. And we'll be happy to send that to anyone here in North America. If you're outside of North America, just go to the Amazing Facts website, just amazingfacts.org or um, .com and you'll be able to read that study guide right there mm -hmm. online. 
We're also going to give you a few other numbers as we work our way through the program. But if you have a Bible-related question, the number to call here to the studio is 800-463-7297. 800-463-7297. And also, if you would like to email us a Bible question, you can do so at balquestions at amazingfacts.org. Balquestions at amazingfacts.org. Pastor Doug, before we get too far into the program, we want to welcome some new uh, radio stations that are carrying this program live. We want to greet those who are listening in Jacksonville, Florida, on the Truth Stations. That's 91.7 FM in Florida, 91.9 FM. And also those listening in Georgia, 91.3 FM. So if you're in the area in Jacksonville, uh, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you this evening. Well, Pastor Doug, before we go to the phone lines, as we always Mm do, we'd like to start with prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for this time that we have to be able to open your word and study. And we always ask for the Spirit to come and guide us here in the studio and be with those who are listening wherever they might be. And Lord, lead us into a clearer understanding of what the Bible teaches. Mm -hmm. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I think we're ready for our first call of this evening. We've got uh, Adrian listening from Texas. Adrian, welcome to the program. Hi, how's it going? Good. Appreciate your calling. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, surreal to be talking to you guys. Been watching y'all for a while. Well, thank you. And how can we help you tonight? What's the question? Okay, so basically the question um, is, how do we reconcile First uh, Corinthians one when Paul is talking about um, that anything meats and stuff that are sacrificed to idols basically means nothing. Mm-hmm. And then Jesus in Revelation 2, verse 14, he's saying that uh, he's actually admonishing the church for eating meats sacrificed to idols. So I was just wondering how we can reconcile those two things. Yeah, well, I think they're talking about two different things. Um, First of all, Revelation is full of symbolism. And in Revelation chapter 2, when he's talking about Balaam, Well, he's clearly not talking about literal Balaam, who had been dead for 1,400 years at that point. And later he talks about Jezebel. He talks about these Old Testament characters because of what they represent. And the idea of eating something sacrificed to idols, it it was probably also talking about eating those things that are unclean, which Daniel would not do, that were sacrificed to idols. Daniel would not be defiled because he wanted to be faithful. Paul was dealing with a different issue. There were uh, Jewish believers that did not think that the Gentiles should eat any meat, clean or unclean, sold in the Roman, the Greco-Roman marketplaces, because whenever they butchered anything, it was butchered in front of an idol. And so Paul is saying, look, um, the idol is nothing. There's nothing wrong with eating clean meat. And so... um, I wouldn't worry about that. If your conscience bothers you, he says in Romans 14, if you're not going to eat it, don't eat it. So they're dealing with a different issue there than what you see in Revelation. And eating things sacrificed to idols in Revelation is really talking about ingesting false teachings that are contaminated by paganism. So there's a whole spiritual overtone in Revelation that you don't have there in 1 Corinthians. All right, thank you. Good question, Adrian. We've got James listening in Illinois. Uh, James, welcome to the program. Thank you. Hi, pastors. Uh, may God continue to bless you both for all that you do. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, do we know the original language? Was it Hebrew or Aramaic before the Tower of Babel? No, I, you know, I think everyone can speculate, but I don't think so. My guess is that when we get to heaven, if we're, you know, we are still speaking the language of Canaan or Eden, that we will find out that there are certain words in many languages that can be traced back to the original language. Um, People that study languages today already see around the world, as people have migrated, they've taken certain words with them. I remember living among the Navajo Indians uh, for about a year and a half in New Mexico, and there was a tribe of uh, Eskimos in uh, Alaska, that spoke an almost identical language. They could understand each other, but all the tribes in between could not understand each other. So, you know, it's obviously there is some migration and languages change. I mean, you look at American English compared to 
England English compared to South African English, which Pastor Ross speaks, mm -hmm. compared to Australian English, and you can see that how quickly languages adopt new words and accents. Although if you had to guess, Pastor Doug, I don't know, what do you think? Do you think maybe the descendants of Seth that stayed probably closer to Noah after you know they left the ark um, spoke a language closer to the language that was spoken before the flood versus those who joined in the Tower of Babel had their languages confused and then dispersed around the globe. You know, we don't know, as you said, yeah, whatever that language is, possible. it's changed a lot over time. Say, something, like modern in languages. say something in Afrikaans. In Afrikaans? Misschien daar is mensen wat kan Afrikaans praat. Okay, anyway. <laughs> that was worth it. No, I, I think people want to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is worth? I think some people understood that. <laughs> So yeah, th just it's amazing how, how languages uh, change over time. But um, yeah, so we don't know. I think Pastor Ross is right. We might find that some of the Semitic languages um, that uh, you're going to find the language of Eden had a lot of similarity. Thanks for that. Appreciate it, James. Thank you, James. We've got next call is Daryl listening in Florida. Daryl, welcome to the program. Hi, pastors. Uh, my question <coughs> is uh, regarding Revelation chapter 13, verse 17. And mm -hmm. I just want to know, uh, why does it say that no one can buy or sell unless they have either the mark of the beast, which I know that is like if you're uh, following the, the Sunday law that's passed, uh, obeying the Sunday law, or the name of the beast, which is Vicar's Feli Di, or Vicar of the Son of God, or... The number of his name, which we all know is 666. So why is it this or this or this? It's like cash or check or credit card. Like, yeah. why Why is it like that? Well, um, my guess is that here in, in Revelation 13, he's really saying anyone who worships the beast, and there's several ways that that might be tested, but it's all going to boil down to the same thing. Uh, when you get to chapter 14, and uh, I think it's mentioned again in chapter 18, it, it just summarizes it by saying those who worship the beast in his image. And so there will be different criteria where you'll prove it. You know, I know that like during World War II, uh, there were laws made to basically eradicate the Jewish people. And there were one of several ways they would identify them. It, it didn't have to be any one way, but they had a few different tests. And so I think it's saying here in Revelation, there's a few different ways that your worship of the beast will be measured. Uh, the buying and selling will be for everybody. If they don't cooperate, there'll be economic sanctions on everybody who does not cooperate and worship the beast. And okay. at the end of time, yeah. there's just two groups, those who have the mark of the beast and those who have the seal of God. And I think the reason it's mentioned here, the mark, the name, the number, it's just reaffirming what this power is. Mm -hmm. There'll be many that'll go along with these laws that have to do with worship or restricting worship because they want to be able to buy and sell. They don't necessarily believe that this is what the world needs. There'll be those who really believe that this is what the world needs and be very supportive of it. But I think the vast majority will just go along so that they can buy and sell. And so there's, there's different motivations why people mm -hmm. will do this. But it's emphasizing this power that's described. You know, we do have a study guide called The Mark of the Beast. And it talks about the subject. And we'll be happy to send that to mm -hmm. anyone who calls and asks. The number to call for that is 800-835-6747, and you can ask for the study guide. It's called The Mark of the Beast, and we'll be happy to get that in the mail to anyone here in North America. All right, thank Next you. caller that we mm -hmm. have is Joel listening in North Carolina. Joel, welcome to the program. Good evening, everybody. Um, Pastor Doug, I think I heard this in your sermons, and if I didn't, if you didn't say this, please tell me so I can be corrected. But I'm trying to figure out why we as Christianity as a whole separate, tries to separate Christianity from uh, the Jewish heritage. Because I think it was you that said, you know, we read a Jewish book, we worship a Jewish Savior, and when we become a Christian, we become spiritual Jews. Yeah, I said that word for word. So that, that's, and I, yeah. I don't understand why Christians try to separate, you know, like they don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, let me give you a few thoughts on that. First of all, if um, if a person accepts Christ, uh, there is a difference between a Christian. Of course, a Christian accept, accepts Jesus as the Messiah. There are a lot of Jews 
So a Christian can't just say, well, I'm now a Jew. I tell my Jewish family, I said, now I'm a completed Jew because, you know, the Jews were supposed to both embrace and proclaim the Messiah. Um, but, uh, and, and so I think that we should embrace the Jewish heritage of uh, the Christian church. Uh, way back in, uh, oh, about 70, 80 AD, after the Jews had rebelled against the Romans and Judaism, uh, the, you know, was uh, basically frowned on and um, they were very upset with the Jewish nation for its rebellion against Rome. There's a lot of anti-Jewish sentiment in the Roman Empire. And so the Christians began to distance themselves a little bit from the Jews because the persecution of the Jews began to overlap and they were persecuting Christians. They said, well, these are, these are Jews. They worship the Sabbath and, and uh, they keep the same laws as the Jews and, and they began to distance themselves. And so, you know, that trend has continued through history. It's just uh, mind boggling that during World War II that you had uh, some Nazis still considered themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. while they were exterminating Jews. And if you've ever read the book, The Hiding Place, um, this one man who is uh, Mr. Tin Boom, who was hiding Jews in his house, he had a Jewish baby, and they said, if you have that Jewish baby and you're caught, they'll kill you. He said, it was a Jewish baby that died for me. Hmm. And so he said, I'm willing to, and he did end up dying. But, um, you know, they had the right attitude. Um, anyway, I, we have a book on that that's called um, Spiritual Israel. And if you'd like to read that, Joel or anybody, I think that's going to help you better understand that Christianity really is rooted in Judaism and there shouldn't be anti-Semitism in Christians' minds. To receive the book, just call the number 800-835-6747. It's called Spiritual Israel, and we'll be happy to send that to anyone who calls and asks. Mm -hmm. If you're outside of North America, just go to the Amazing Facts website, amazingfacts.com or .org. We've got... Uh, June, listening in California. June, welcome to the program. Hello. Hello, pastors. How are you? Good. Thank you for calling. Thank you for taking my call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a quick question on uh, Exodus 4.24. Uh, I'm just um, wondering why God would want to kill Moses. Yeah, this, is a, this verse usually gets some interesting um, questions. People are reading through the Bible, and they go through Exodus. They get to chapter 4. And it, uh, it makes this interesting statement where Moses is on his way to Egypt and in route it says the Lord tried to slay him. Now, just the very idea that God would try to slay somebody it's, can <laughs> leave you wondering, did God swing and miss? You know, if God wants to slay you, he's going to slay you. And basically it's saying that, um, that the wrath of God was rising up against Moses because Moses had been called to lead the people. He'd accepted the call. He had been convicted by the Holy Spirit that as the leader, he needed to embrace the covenant to Abraham. He had not had his own son, or at least one of his sons, circumcised. And I think maybe he had argued about this with his wife because finally his wife says, okay, she circumcises the boy. And she said, you're a bloody man. Maybe she thought it was barbaric or who knows what the discussion was. But Moses had not followed through in doing what God said. And God was saying, if you continue going down the road, you're in high-handed disobedience. You're going to be leading my covenant people, and you're not following the covenant in your own family. So reading between the lines, most commentators think this is what was happening here. And I think you, the, the verse there, or at least the, the idea, as you mentioned, Pastor Doug, if, if God wanted to destroy Moses, yeah, he would have done it. But uh, uh, the Lord appeared in a threatening manner to Moses. Kind of like the angel with Balaam and his donkey. That's right, with a raised sword he, maybe. He could something. have killed him if he wanted right. to. <laughs> just to illustrate the importance of uh, what it is that Moses had to do in being faithful to the covenant. Good question. Next caller that Thank we have you. is uh, Claudette listening from New Jersey. Claudette, welcome to the program. Good evening, Pastor Doug. Thanks for taking me. Yeah. And, pa and Pastor Ross. Yes, my question is, based on um, 1 Corinthians 11, mm. verse 5 and 6, and also verse 15, it says, but every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as she was shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. And then in verse 15 it says, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given for her co for a covering. So if, she's, if a woman has long hair and she's prophesying or praying in church, 
two chiefs to be our head covering over her, over her nutshell here. All right, here's the big question, and it's a, it's a valid question, and this, uh, whenever we get this question, we need to answer with some humility because it's a difficult verse. Um, the big question is, was Paul addressing a custom or was he addressing a command? There's no command earlier in the Bible that women should not pray with or without their heads covered. I don't know if there's anything that says anything about uh, the only time it talks about it covering the head is sometimes if they were mourning, they would cover their heads. But um, so later in the same chapter, and Pastor Ross, you probably can find the verse that says, for we have no such custom. I think the word custom is actually used in this passage. Let me give you an example, Claudette. When I am in uh, oh Japan or some places in India, Pastor Ross and I were in a church in India where <laughs> they get, you know, 18,000 people all take off their shoes, mm -hmm. put them in cubby holes. Well, it, it's considered uh, bad manners and disrespectful for you to uh, walk in with your shoes. And Paul is saying that, you know, it was a custom that women, as a sign of humility, that they cover their heads. Was that cultural? And then Paul is saying your hair is a covering. God gives women a natural covering of hair, typically more than men. Um, and then he later says in another place, you know, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. So he's just saying there, there ought to be this distinction. But, um, it, you know, it appears it's a custom. I have no qualms. If, some, if a woman says, I'm convicted, I should cover my head when I'm in church, I'd say, praise the Lord, you follow the Holy Spirit. It certainly won't hurt anybody. I think the point also, Pastor Doug, is it's emphasizing reverence in the sanctuary. Yeah. And again, different customs, different ways of doing things back in Bible times. And again, also in Middle East, even mm -hmm. today, that is a sign of reverence. In our culture, Pastor Doug, it would be a sign of, of um, disrespect or, or a lack of reverence if a man walks into a church and he leaves on his big cowboy hat. I mean, y you remove your hat when you come into a church. That's yeah. a sign of respect. Mm -hmm. So I think the context there is we need to be reverent when we enter into worship and in the presence of right. God, whatever that culture might be. Yeah, and Paul is saying the women were behaving in a scandalous, disrespectful way in the Corinthian church, and he was addressing that. You know, the verse you refer to is also 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16, where Paul says, but if anyone seems to be contentious, we do not have such a custom, nor do the churches of God. Mm -hmm. So it's ref referring to a specific situation that was taking place there. Yep. Amen. All right, thank you for your call. Uh, we've got Tay Vision listening in Illinois. Tay Vision, welcome to the program. It's Tay Vion. Hey, Hi. Tay Vion, welcome. There you go. Um, uh, my question is, um, if I can talk correctly, uh, my question is, um, how do you know that the Holy Spirit's still working in you if you've been a Christian for years and you've noticed that you're not as sensitive or as passionate about Christ as you used to be? Well, first of all, don't get discouraged. Um, you just described what it says in Revelation chapter 2, where he says the Ephesian church had lost its first love. They were still his people. They were still his church. You'll often see even in a marriage that during the time of dating and honeymoon, there's just uh, there's a lot of um, romance and excitement. And then, you know, after 10 years of marriage, things become a little more routine. Well, the Lord, you know, in our marriages, we want to keep that love alive and also in uh, your relationship with the Lord doesn't mean you're not a Christian anymore. Um, you know, even Mary and Joseph, they took their eyes off Jesus when he was a young man. They lost him in Jerusalem. And Mary said, we spent three days sorrowing and searching for you. And if we take our eyes off Jesus, sometimes we spend some time sorrowing and searching to find him again. But I would say, um, seek after the Lord and he'll be found. That's the promise. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. You want to renew that relationship that love and the way that happens he said jesus said do the first works i'm sure when you first fell in love with the lord you were pouring over his word you're spending time in prayer you were thinking about his presence you were sharing him with your friends do those things again and you'll find a renewal in the holy spirit and the you know your sense of god's presence you know i'm just wondering pastor Doug, what book we have that might 12 be. steps to revival there we go that's the one that'll be a great blessing yep. To anyone wanting to have a deeper, fuller experience with Jesus, uh, read the book. It's, um, we'll send it to you for free. The number is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the book 12 Steps for Revival. We'll be happy to send it to mm -hmm. you. Also, Pastor Doug, you did a series not too long ago uh, called 
The New Heart. I think it's mm -hmm. a 10-part series. And that is available, I believe, on YouTube. So if you want to look that up, yeah. Doug Amazing Batchelor. Facts website. It's under our, our, our the media amazing, ministry. That's right. right there. Also on the Amazing Facts website. So um, that'll be a blessing. Uh, next caller that we have is Daniel, and he's listening from VI. Where is that? Virginia? Daniel, welcome uh, to the Yes, program. Pastors. Thank you, Pastors. Uh, good evening. Yeah, calling evening. from uh, Virginia here. Uh, just a question on Revelation 14, 7, the first angel's message. Uh, you know, I know that um, the last part of the, the verse there is a direct reference to the fourth commandment, uh, the Sabbath commandment. I was just wondering whether commentators have said, or in general it's understood, that the first three commandments can be found in that verse as well. Fear God would be the first commandment. Give glory to him by reflecting his image. The second commandment, for the hour's judgment has come. Um, in other words, judging between who's taking the, the Lord's name in vain and who's not. I'm wondering if you can see in general the the first table of the fourth uh, the ten commandments there in that verse and in the, in the counterpart verse as well in fi Revelation fifteen two where it talks about the victory over the beast the first commandment over his image the second commandment over his mark the fourth commandment and over the number of his name which would be the third commandment I don't know if you see that or if commentators have seen that or yeah. if that's kind of a stretch well. I, I, I don't know that I view it all the same way, but it's interesting that you're saying this because just moments before the program, I was thinking about Revelation 14 and how Revelation 14 is sort of a condensed Bible. The, the last message is found in there, and you're making me think as you're speaking about just seeing the, uh, the other commandments in this passage. Um, and for our, our friends that are listening, the, the Bible is written in a chiastic form, meaning that it, you, you've kind of got like uh, the white bread. <laughs> my, let's say it's whole wheat bread just for health's sake. And then in the middle, you've got the substance. And it's often in the Hebrew writings that in the middle, you'll find the climax. Revelation 14 is like the climax of Revelation. It's all concentrated in there. And um, it, it sort of summarizes who, who is saved and who is lost and why. So um, you can also find, I think, the law of God talks about those who keep the commandments of God in verse 12. That's, uh, that's fascinating. Well, I appreciate that. And and give me, give me some ideas. Yeah. The first angel's message actually quotes from the fourth commandment where it says, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea. Right. So that's actually from part of the Ten Commandments. Yeah, and I can see, I, you can see allusions to the other commandments uh, in earlier in that verse or other places. Uh, friends, we don't have time to do another question before we finish our first half, but we've got a lot more Bible question time coming. So stay tuned. We have some important announcements for you. We're going to be back. And, and call in with your Bible questions. 800-GOD-SAYS. 800-GOD-SAYS. And we'll be back. In stay tuned. Bible Answers Live will return shortly. to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Through radio, television, print, evangelistic events, and the internet, Amazing Facts International is heeding the call of Jesus to go into all the world. Millions of individuals in over 150 countries have been blessed by the Word of God. Amazing Facts has spawned new spheres of influence in India, Africa, China, and Indonesia. With each new country come hundreds of translated booklets, study guides, and video presentations produced in each region for the people of that region. Armed with these precious truths, gospel workers are empowered to spread bright rays of light on every path they travel. Please visit reachtheworld.amazingfacts.org to learn more about Amazing Facts International and how you can participate in this exciting soul-winning ministry. That website again is reachtheworld.amazingfacts.org. Thank you for your support. The U.S. government is drowning in debt to the tune of $22 trillion. But before you wag your finger at the government spending, the Federal Reserve says the average American household carries over $137,000 in debt. Well, it was never God's plan that we live with a burden of debt. Proverbs 22.7 warns us, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Living with debt is a stressful burden that actually hurts your relationship with God. In my new pocketbook, Deliverance from Debt, I outline the Bible principles on how to properly manage your money with some practical suggestions on how you can get out and stay out of debt. If you or someone you love is drowning in debt, 
order a copy of Deliverance from Debt today, it can be a lifesaver to keep you from going under. Please call 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, where every question answered provides a clearer picture of God and His plan to save you. So what are you waiting for? Get practical answers about the good book for a better life today. If you have a question about the Bible or living the Christian life, call us now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, let's rejoin our hosts for more Bible Answers Live. Welcome back, listening friends, to Bible Answers Live. And if you're tuning in for the first time, this is a live international interactive Bible study, and we invite people around the country and other parts of the world, call in with your Bible questions. We'll do our best to give you a a brief answer. Sometimes we can't give a big comprehensive answer to some of the questions, but we try to take as many questions as we can and make them understandable so that we can apply the Word of God to our lives. My name is Doug Batchelor. My name is Jean Ross, and we've got uh, Bronwyn listening and ready with his question. Bronwyn from Tennessee, welcome to the program. Hello, good evening. Evening. And so your my question. question is, yeah. is, if God knows the beginning to the end, why did he create Satan? That's a good question. Um, Sometimes the Lord allows things, even though he knows that it's going to cause problems. He made all of his creatures free, and he even made a beautiful angel named Lucifer, very powerful angel, made him free. That means he's free to love God, to worship God, to make choices. Lucifer chose to not love God and to love himself more, and all of the sin in the universe has come from people making that choice. Um, So... Before, now how old are you? Do you mind my asking? I will be 21 in October, so I'm 20. You're 20, okay. <laughs> you sounded younger, forgive me. Uh, when, you're, when your parents decided to have you, assuming it was a, a free choice, <laughs> uh, did they get any kind of written guarantee that uh, you would always be cooperative and a good child and obedient? No. <laughs> but they took a risk because they wanted to love you and wanted love. And that you might make other choices, right? Yes, sir. So God made his creatures and gave them freedom to choose, knowing there was a risk. And he knew what Lucifer would do. And it's demonstrating to the whole universe what the problem of sin is. And uh, it'll never happen again. So, uh, but you know, we have a DVD that covers this that you can probably watch for free online. I think we have New Cosmic Conflict magazine is out. That's right. We've got several things. Well, actually, it's just coming out. It's not printed yet. It's not yet. Well, we do have the Cosmic Conflict DVD. And um, Bronwyn or anyone listening or watching, you can just simply go to the Amazing Facts website and you'll Mm -hmm. be able to view that that DVD there. Or I think it's also available on YouTube. We also have a study guide that's called Did God Create a Devil? Mm -hmm. And we'll be happy to send that to anyone who calls and asks. The number is 800-835-6747 and ask for the book. It's called Did God Create a Devil? And we'll send that to anyone who calls and asks. Mm-hmm. Jose is listening in Puerto Rico. Jose, welcome to the program. Hello, welcome. Can you hear me? We can. Thanks for calling. Ah, uh, uh, sure. My question is: uh, If Christ's suffering was a byproduct of our sins, or a requirement for our salvation? Um, I'm looking for the tabernacle, and the tabernacle, of, of course, is the representation of Jesus. But in the tabernacle, the the sacrificial lamb does not have passed for a tribulation like a suffering of Christ. Right. Well, of course, keep in mind that the sacrificial system with lambs was symbolic. Clearly, a lamb cannot think and experience the anguish of a human of betrayal and those different things. Uh, in fact, the, the priest kind of went out of the way to make the sacrifice of the lamb as painless and quick as possible uh, because it all symbolized Christ and his sacrifice. But the sacrifice of Christ uh, the, the hardest part was not actually the death. It was the suffering, the separation from God in the death that he experienced. That's like when Jonah went into the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. Jesus, when God withdrew his protection there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went through incredible suffering 
and turmoil where he's weeping in the garden, perspiring blood. So um, the lamb, I wouldn't try and make a too strong a comparison because the lamb was simply a symbol. Mm -hmm. A symbol of Jesus. And of course, the wages of sin is death. And mm -hmm. that's what was emphasized. But along with the wages of sin, uh, there is suffering. Mm -hmm. We know that everyone at the end will be rewarded according to their works. So that's both for the righteous and the unrighteous. There are, there are degrees of judgment, degrees of punishment for the right. wicked. Christ suffered for the sins of the whole world, the Bible tells us. Mm -hmm. All well, right. Well, thank, thank you, you. Fred in Oregon. Fred, welcome to the program. Thank you much. Thanks for taking my call. Mm -hmm. My question, uh, Matthew 25, verse 9 were the five foolish asked the five wise for some of their oil, and they said no, that they had to go to those that sell to buy their own. Now, I know in Revelation 13, if you have, you can't buy or sell unless you have the mark. So is this an indication that these five foolish have the mark? You know, I, I think that the parable of the ten virgins is not just talking about um, the mark of the beast and the seal of God. I think it's talking about professed Christians and, and it not only applies to the last days because Jesus does make Matthew 25 is on the heels of the signs of his second coming. But I think in every age, God has had his people that some that had a knowing relationship, they've had the Holy Spirit, they had a reserve and those who were careless and they were not watching and praying, they were not ready they, they had not fortified their faith for times of trial and darkness. And, uh, or they lost their patience. You know, the Bible talks about he that endures to the end will be saved. Certainly in the last days, those that are lost, the five foolish virgins, they would be getting the mark of the beast. And the five who have it, uh, have the oil, they're going to have the seal of God, they'll be saved. But um, I don't know if I'm answering what you're asking. <laughs> It's it's just been something that that I've wondered about because we obviously we in the last days are not able to can't buy or sell uh, can't buy or sell and yeah I just didn't know with these well with, with these the ten five virgins foolish when they're, yeah when when the wise virgins pardon me for jumping in but when the wise virgins tell the foolish you must buy for yourself we cannot take someone else's experience uh, from them we must have our own experience they said you've got to have it for yourself. And they waited too long to have that personal experience or to have that filling with the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, that, that applies. It's a truth in every time. Uh, I don't think it's talking so much about buying and selling. Where is it? In Revelation chapter 3, where Jesus has, says to the church of Laodicea, you know, buy of me gold tried in the fire. And, and Isaiah says, ho, everyone that thirsts, buy without money, without price. And so when it says buy, it doesn't always mean, you know, going to the, market and pulling out your credit card buy means to go obtain and these are all professed followers of christ right describes them as waiting for the bridegroom and they're virgins that's right they have yeah. a pure faith they have the lamp which represents the word of god so even with amongst those who profess to be waiting for the coming of jesus you've got the wise and you've got the foolish mm -hmm. now the foolish will eventually get the mark of the beast but at that time where they're all together they're all professing to follow Christ. So yeah. it's, it's sort of a warning, a wake-up call mm -hmm. for the church, I think. Yeah, and they're all waiting for the bridegroom to come. That's right. All right, thank you for your call. We've got John listening in um, any... Nebraska. I remember all my states here. Nebraska, John in Nebraska, welcome. That's right. Thank you for taking my call. Appreciate it. Watch you guys all the time. Thank you, John. And your question... Well, it's kind of a mixed-up question, but I'll try to get it out the way I want to talk it to your man beforehand. <clears throat> if uh, Jesus said, if you lust after a woman, you've committed adultery in your heart. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, if, a, if a man is watching porn all the time and he's lusting after the woman, he's committing adultery in his heart. If a wife gets a divorce, can she remarry? That'd be my question, I guess. Okay, that, I, what you said makes sense. Um, First of all, I would not compare uh, a man or a woman who's having a struggle with pornography as being the same thing as committing an actual affair. Um, you know, in most laws, most countries, thinking about murdering someone is definitely not the same thing as murdering somebody. 
And so when a person is committing adultery in their heart, there's definitely sin in the heart. And Jesus says that and there's a sin of adultery in the heart. But it's not the same as committing the act of adultery. And I think that's so important to understand because I've met uh, men and women before that said, well, I'm thinking about it. I may as well do it. Mm. Well, there's a big difference between the two. Um, and I've <laughs> I've talked to women before and they said, you know, my husband, I, I caught him of viewing pornography, and so that's adultery, and so I'm going to divorce him. Uh, I also think that's a mistake. Uh, I don't think this is what Jesus is talking about. Uh, now, it is certainly a sin. Uh, if a woman uh, divorces a man and she does not have biblical grounds, or if a man divorces his wife, Christ said they don't really have a right to remarry. Um, and I know I'll probably get letters on this uh, that you know people are going to say, well, it, it's the same thing. Uh, I actually went into depth in my book on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, I talk about this because a lot of people have asked about it. Mm -hmm. uh, pornography is an epidemic today. And uh, there's a lot of people that are wondering, well, since my spouse has had a problem with this, um, is that grounds for divorce? It becomes a really slippery slope when you say yes, because some people describe pornography as the daytime soap operas. Mm -hmm. you, can, you know, two people obviously committing adultery. And it goes from there all the way to what they call hard porn. And so where do you draw the line? If you start saying thinking it is the same as doing it, then you know you can drive by a billboard with a girl in a bathing suit and say, now I can file for divorce. Mm -hmm. and, and so you've got to be very careful. I hope that makes sense to everybody. And of course, I think you're emphasizing the fact, Pastor Doug, that it's still sin. Jesus makes yeah, it very clear. Exactly. It's something that needs to be repented of. And if somebody continues down those paths, they are going to eventually harden their heart against the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And, and the attitude often leads to the action. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But it's not necessarily the same thing. Right. So we need to be aware of that. Good question. Thank you for calling. Next caller that we have is Guy listening from California. Guy, welcome to the program. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. Yes. And your question. Okay. So my question is uh, regarding uh, Genesis 31, verse 19. Uh, and it says in that verse that now Laban had gone to see to the cutting of the wool of his sheep. So Rachel secretly took the images of the gods of her father's house. Mm -hmm. So why did Rachel steal uh, images or gods uh, of Laban? Or is there some kind of uh, secret uh, power to these gods or these idols? I mean, were they going to tell him or tell, tell uh, yeah, were they going to tell him where Rachel and um, yeah, the the, the, the word yeah. gods there. They they used to have idols that were like it was a god, and it was something of like a property deed. You'll read later where. Uh, first of all, uh, I I highly recommend that nobody has a god that can be stolen, because if your god can be packed in someone's camel back and wrote, written off with, you got a pretty small god. So th that always strikes me as funny that he, Laban comes and says, "You stole my gods." <laughs> <laughs> and she she put him in the saddlebag and sat on them, uh, sitting on his gods. So most commentators that I've seen, Pastor Ross, you may have seen something different in this. They say that because the the daughter said to, to Jacob, our father has taken our dowry. He hasn't given, you know, everything that we should have gotten as a dowry. He's taken from us. He spent it. And the girls wanting to have something of value took, uh, or at least Rachel took these gods, these idols, which were like property deeds. And um, they had some value attached to them. It, there was some monetary value attached to it. And I think it's also clear that, um, you know, the family, Rachel's family, Laban and alike, even though they claimed to worship the true God, the customs of those living mm -hmm. around them had probably crept into uh, their understanding. For that reason, it was important that God was to take Abraham and his descendants out from right. the land of Ur. So there was kind of a little bit of a mix of idolatry. And maybe that was also part of the reason. Here she's leaving home. She wants to take something maybe to remind her of no, home. No, they were little idols. Yeah, and she But I don't know that they worshipped them. I, but they, they did l have little idols, I think, that were sort of like Carved out of stone yeah. or whatever it is. And they had value. Maybe yeah. they could be sold for something. Yeah. All right. Interesting. Good question. All right. We've got uh, Jared listening from Missouri. Jared, welcome to the program. Uh, hello. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Jared. Your question. Uh, my question is, if we're supposed to judge the evil angels, doesn't that mean we were predestined to fall into temptation at the 
Garden of Eden, since we had to know good and evil at the the tree of good and evil? I'm not sure I understand the the rationale of your question. You, you know, the Bible does. Do you not know that you will judge angels? I agree with that. So you're saying that that somehow is connected with predestination? Yeah, because uh, we had to uh, to know evil. We had to eat the fruit of good and evil to judge, right? Yeah. Well, I I think let me let's just back up and talk about what the verse is saying. I think Paul is telling us that when he says, "Know ye not that you will judge angels," he's talking. I think that's First Corinthians seven. He's he's saying, you know, you need to be able to judge in the smallest matters. Don't you know you can even judge angels? Well, obviously, Christians are not going to decide if angels are saved or lost. Um, when we get to heaven, the veil's pulled aside. We're going to not only see our guardian angels, we probably are going to see the angels that were our uh, our uh, menaces. Uh, during our lives, our adversaries that Satan had appointed to tempt us. And we're going to say, yes, this angel was the one that, you know, was leading me into sin. And, uh, you know, he deserves his punishment. So we'll be affirming the judgments of God, uh, I think, in that. But um, I don't know why predestination would need to fit into that scenario. In other words, can you judge without knowing evil between good and evil? Well, I think you can. Yeah. I mean, to judge is to discern, and even Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, it was never God's purpose or desire that they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they could choose, and they could discern and say, nope, we don't want to eat of that, mm -hmm. we do want to eat of this. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, you know, partake of evil to know that it's bad. Right. We do have a book that talks about predestination, and it's called, Can a Saved Man Choose to Be Lost? If you'd like to receive that, the number to call is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the book, Can a Saved Man Choose to Be Lost? We'll be happy to send that to anyone in North America. Next caller that we have, Connor, listening from Colorado. Connor, welcome to the program. Thanks for your patience. Yep, thank you. How are you guys? Doing great. All righty. So um, I've been keeping the original Sabbath for a while now, and I had some friends and family that, just um, kind of argued with the importance, of course, in a friendly way. And I just wanted to know what the importance was of keeping the original Sabbath. Well, when you say the original Sabbath, um, you know, the Bible tells us that God created the world in six days, that he blessed the seventh day. Uh, that was reiterated for the children of Israel when he saved them. He said, remember, now God wanted to say remember if something didn't prior exist. Uh, they had forgotten it living among the Egyptians. He said, remember the I've set aside a day for spiritual and physical rest to worship God. And God blessed that day. God rested that day. He says, I've blessed a particular day, the seventh day, and I want you to remember the seventh day. And it says it three times there. He blessed the seventh day. He sanctified the seventh day, and he asks us to remember that. Well, over time, during uh, the uh, time of the Roman era, there was a, got a lot of compromise, and they s gradually switched from the seventh day to the first day. Um, and you can read about that during the time of Constantine. He's the one who published the Edict of Milan. I would say that if it's one of the Ten Commandments, how important is one of the Ten Commandments? And, you know, some will argue it doesn't matter what day it is as long as it's a seventh day, but God doesn't say keep a seventh day. He says keep the seventh day. It's a particular day. God didn't say for everybody to pick their own day. Think about the... Uh, the chaos that would be in the Christian church if everyone picks their own day of worship and there's no corporate worship. So, um, you know, the Sabbath can be traced all the way back to Adam and Eve. They kept it in the Old Testament. The apostles kept it. Jesus kept it. And it says in Isaiah, we're going to keep it in heaven. So that's a quick summary. It's still important. We have Absolutely. a lesson on that that has all these. We do. It's called the Lost Day of History. And we'll be happy to send this to anyone who calls and asks. Mm -hmm. The number is 800 835 6747 ask for the amazing facts study guide is called the lost day in history we also have a website called sabbathtruth.com yes. that's filled with great bible studies there's video all on the subject of the bible sabbath and you'll mm -hmm. enjoy taking a look at that we've got bruce listening from north carolina bruce welcome to the program hello pastors hi thank you for calling i would like to um for you to explain the time prophecy in daniel 12. All right, now for our friends that are listening, uh, last chapter of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, brings about a summary of the prophecies mentioned earlier in the book. 
Uh, Daniel outlines um, the history of God's people and the battle they're going to have with good and evil and even highlights the beast power in uh, Daniel chapter 7, 8, 9, uh, 11. And uh, so when you get to chapter 12, he backs up and he reviews those time periods. One time is 1260 years. Then there's another time that is 1290 years and then there's 1335 years. And you know, I said a minute ago, we try to summarize our questions in two or three minutes. It's hard to do that with this question. But those three time prophecies, you can see that, let's start with the 1260. 1260 is mentioned several times in the Bible. 1260 in the Jewish year, that's 1,260 days. That is three and a half years. Jesus taught for three and a half years. The famine of Elijah, three and a half years. Um, Esther's process to choose Esther began three and a half years after this feast, or you know, after the um, book begins up to the feast. Um, and in Daniel, it talks about a time, a times in the dividing of a time. A time was a year, a times was a pair or a couple of years. That's two and th one is three and a dividing a half. 42 months is in Revelation. 42 months, 30 days of the Jewish month, 1260 days. You've got that time period. Talks about a time of apostasy, resistance, persecution. Happened several times in the Bible. And so um, that is one of the principal times it's repeated in Revelation. Daniel adds the time 1290 and 1335 because he gives a starting point in Christian history when um, uh, Clovis. The, yeah, Clovis, the king of the Franks, the Ro Holy Roman Empire basically was inaugurated. Mm -hmm. and yeah, the date for that 508. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's significant about that date is Clovis, who was uh, leader of the Franks, was in opposition at first to the Roman power, to the papacy. But when he converted to Christianity, he was a pagan, when he converted to Christianity, that really opened up the whole area known today as, of, as France um, to become supportive of the papal power. Yeah. So 508 is considered the starting date for that 1290. And the 1335, starting at that same date in 508, brings you up to 1843, when there was a great revival that was taking place in North America and other places around the world. And they were discovering the prophecies of Daniel, mm -hmm. in particular the 2300 days of Daniel 814. So just a, a really interesting study when you look at these different time periods. You know, Pastor Doug, we probably, I don't think we have a book specifically on Daniel 12, but maybe that's something we, we need to work write on. We need to write one. As you're talking, we, I get, a lot we of get this question. We need to write something. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, thanks for your call. We've got, uh, let's see, Jim listening in Canada. Jim, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you for very much uh, very much for uh, having me on. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'd like, do like to say you guys are my favorite pastors uh, on TV. Well, thank uh, you. I joined the seventh day uh, a few years ago, and uh, and uh, it's a blessing. Well, bless um, your heart. But thank my you. question is, well, my question is, is the commandment of thou shalt not kill, and and I notice that a lot of pastors are saying thou shalt not murder. Now, to me, that's changing it, and God said not to change it. So, and I've noticed, like, when I watched that movie, Hacksaw Ridge, Dobbs could not be swayed, and yeah. he did not kill. And he performed, a, to me, a super miracle. He saved all those people on that ridge. Yeah, it was remarkable. Uh, you know, well, let me talk about remarkable. that. Yeah, he, uh, he, he yeah. refused to pick up a gun, and he was not going to kill. He, he was uh, a fellow human. And, of course, Jesus tells us to overcome evil with a good uh, by the way, I knew Desmond Doss, and uh, just a wonderful man. Um, his, uh, his wife was, her family was in a church I pastored, so I'd see him on a regular basis. He'd come up to visit her family. Anyway, um, Jesus actually uses the word, and you might look this up, Pastor Ross, I think it's in Mark chapter 10, when Jesus is quoting the Ten Commandments to the rich young ruler, and he quotes that commandment, he specifically says, thou shalt not murder. Now, there is a difference between murder and killing. And I think you'll agree, Jim, that, you know, if you step on a weed and you kill it, you're not going to be called a, a murderer. And that's not breaking that commandment, thou shalt not kill. Or if a mosquito's biting you and you swat it to put it out of its misery, uh, you've technically killed the mosquito, but you've not broken the commandment, thou shalt not kill. That commandment, is, and then why would God tell Moses, thou shalt not kill, 
and then tell Moses to execute and stone certain people that had broken other commandments. Mm -hmm. yeah. The verse you're referring to, Matthew 19, 18, which Jesus says, Thou shalt not murder, and he uses the word murder. Yeah. Murder is defined as uh, taking of innocent life, and uh, human life in particular. So um, I, I do think that y we've got to be careful not to think of thou shalt not kill in the broad sense of killing anything. It's really talking about taking of innocent human life. If a person is um, defending their family and some crazed murderer comes into their home and in the process of defending their family, they have to kill the perpetrator they are not ever tried by any people as a killer because mm -hmm. uh, they, they've not committed murder. It's just self-defense. Or if somebody, you know, an accident occurs yeah. and uh, accidentally somebody gets killed and it, it's just an accident, you're not, uh, you, you don't hold that person accountable for murder. Matter of fact, there's even a story in the Bible and it gives the example if you're swinging an axe and the axe head comes off and kills somebody, uh, you know, you're not held liable for murder. They're, you go to a city of refuge, and then they find that it was an accident, and you're yeah. free. Yeah, and even the laws today, you know, laws about manslaughter, talking about unintentional. Mm -hmm. You've got premeditated murder, so forth. So, yeah, I think it's closer to say thou shalt not murder, even though I know the King James in some versions say thou shalt not kill. Uh, I, would, I would respect that. We do have our lesson we started out with, saying written in stone, talks more about that law. Now, Pastor Ross, for our friends that are listening or watching right now, we, we sort of sign off in stages. We want to say goodbye to our friends that are listening on satellite radio, but the rest of you don't go anywhere because in just a moment we're going to come back. We're going to take some rapid fire Bible questions that you have sent in via email. God bless to the rest. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. We hope you understand your Bible even better than before. Bible Answers Live is produced by Amazing Facts International, a faith-based ministry located in Granite Bay, California. Hello, friends. Welcome back. We have about uh, two and a half minutes, Pastor Doug, to answer some of the email questions that have come into the program. If you'd like to send us an email question, the email address is balquestions at amazingfacts.org. All right, question number one. Brittany is asking, what did Jesus mean when he called the Pharisees a brood of vipers? Yeah, and uh, I think that um, even John the Baptist uses that term. Well, in the Bible, vipers are considered snakes. They're considered uh, synonymous in many places with the devil, whereas at Revelation chapter 12 is at least one place where it calls that old serpent, the dragon, Satan. And so it calls him the devil, Satan, dragon, serpent and so when you say a brood of vipers he's basically saying you're a bunch of demon-led individuals mm -hmm. which is you know you think about a snake pit mm -hmm. and they would get together and they would connive and talk about how to you know persecute god's prophets and and so jesus and uh, then they let a lot of people stray he said you rob widows houses so it was not a compliment okay we have another question jackie is asking do we really have to pray for those who are wicked? Well, you know, Jesus says, love your enemies. And uh, we should be thankful that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So even in our lostness and our wickedness, uh, wickedness would be, you know, sort of like intentional disobedience. Um, God is merciful to us. And I think we know there are stories in the Bible of people who are wicked. I think of Manasseh was probably the best example you know, sacrificed his children in the fire, killed Isaiah the prophet, a uh, wicked man, he went through a dramatic conversion. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I even wicked people can be reached by the power of God. We also have the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Yeah. All right, right, another question that we have. Isabel wants to know, how can she be bold for Jesus, but in a subtle way, because she's timid? Well, you can, of course, be bold in your prayers. And... Uh, the Lord can make even a timid person bold at the right time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he talks about the righteous are as bold as a lion. Um, so I think, you know, as you just pray for opportunity to speak up, you can be bold with the words that you speak, and they don't have to be loud. You can say something profound, uh, and it'll get everyone's attention. Okay. Well, Pastor Doug, we want to remind our friends who are listening, if you have a Bible question, and you'd like to submit it to the program, just email balquestions at amazingfacts.org and we will try to answer as many questions as we can before we run out of time. And you hear music in the background, 
So we want to thank you for joining us. And next week, we look forward to meeting you again for another program of Bible Answers Live. Bible Answers Live. Honest and accurate answers to your Bible questions.